We're in Lebanon, outside of Tripoli. Our reporter Alex Pototsky is making his way through the narrow streets into one of the largest camps for Palestinian refugees, where reporters are usually not allowed. They are routinely turned away. The car is passing a dumpster and a car stripped for parts. You can see lots of flags on buildings, the Palestinian flag and some others. There are lots of flags here, and I don't know the meaning of all of them yet, but I will find out what they represent. We are outside of Tripoli and about to enter the Palestinian refugee camp, where I won't be able to shoot openly, at least at the start. You have to have permission for pretty much anything around here, obtained from the local authorities that are mostly autonomous from the Lebanese government. Due to the ongoing armed conflict between the neighboring state of Israel and the Gaza Strip, the situation is even more complicated. Tensions inside the camp have increased, causing unrest from time to time. Last August, an armed conflict broke out in one of such camps, leaving over a dozen people dead. Alex is accompanied by a local. His name is Abed. They are joined by yet another guy who is a resident of the camp and can introduce our crew to the camp authorities. Hello, I'm Alex. What's your name? Bilal. Bilal? Bilal. Bilal? Okay, nice to meet you. Bilal will help us clear all the checkpoints where no filming is allowed. We have just cleared one small checkpoint at the entrance to the camp. I was asked to put away my camera so I can't film anything openly for now. Finally, the guys are taken to the office of the local authorities, who call the shots here. They don't report to the country's authorities, and sometimes even fight against them. So it's totally unclear yet how they will receive Alex and what will happen next. No, no, no. Uh, what's happened? How far is the hospital? My name is Alex Pototsky and I'm a roaming reporter. Right now, I'm in Lebanon making a special report for the People Channel. Today, I'm in the city of Tripoli. I've come here to show you how people live in a refugee camp. In camps like this, there are Palestinians, Syrians, and even locals from Lebanon. Today, we'll see what life is like for people who have lost their homes to war. Let's go. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet? The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right, go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. You see, Lebanon is a small country that borders on Israel and Syria and has a population of roughly 5 million people. But of these, at least 2 million people are refugees and displaced persons. That's practically every third person in the country. We are here to see how people live in one of the camps housing all these refugees and displaced individuals. This camp is located close to Lebanon's second largest city, Tripoli. The country's capital, Beirut, is located roughly 50 miles to the south. We've been taken to this small office. I can see lots of photos of martial arts athletes and trophies on the wall, which makes it look like a PE classroom rather than an office of a local figure of authority. Uh, do you have any card like uh, journalist or photographer? Sure, yeah. just a moment. No. I have my press card on me, issued by the People Channel. It's basically a piece of paper and plastic. The local boss asked to see it. And after he saw it, he told me to always wear it on my chest. And he even gave me this red rope, this badge rope, so everyone could see that I'm not some stranger who somehow got here, but a reporter. I was actually wrong. This guy wasn't the boss. I went through a few checks, and that guy who I thought was the boss looked through all my papers, and only after that, he said I could see the boss. I was told that all these checks are for security reasons, including my own security, since the situation is now tense. And so I got to meet the local figure of authority, who is also in charge of the local healthcare committee, Abu Allah. The camp was created in 1948. This was just a wasteland where some tents were put up. But we don't plan to stay here forever. This camp, like all others, is considered to be a temporary shelter until people can return to Palestine. 
The camp does not answer to the government of Lebanon. They have their own authority, with people like Abu Ala in charge of all important aspects of life, such as healthcare, education, and naturally, security. It's more like a state within a state. Palestinians have been living in this camp for several decades, but everyone here says they're ready to pack up and leave for home any moment. The camp's key problem today is overpopulation. We can provide electricity, healthcare, infrastructure, and satisfy all other needs of 20,000 people at most. While today, we have 50,000 people residing here. Wait a second, why don't we try and see why Lebanon got to have camps for Palestinian refugees in the first place? Time for a short history lesson. Until 1948, Palestine was ruled by Britain under the Mandate for Palestine and Transjordan, and there were lots of Jews living on its territory. Once Britain's mandate in the Middle East was declared expired, the League of Nations took over. On May 14, 1948, establishment of the State of Israel was proclaimed within the borders that claimed part of Palestinian territories. The Palestinians were extremely displeased and declared war on Israel on May 15. They were supported by several Arab states, including Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon. Israel победил. Israel won that war and claimed more territories, while Palestinians were forced to flee to other countries, to Syria, Jordan, but above all, to Lebanon. Because back then, it was fairly quiet and peaceful there. So you may be wondering where the camp actually is, right? One would expect to see tents, lots of bags and suitcases, and people sleeping on makeshift beds. We are now out for a walk around the Palestinian refugee camp near Tripoli. I'm accompanied by my fixer, Abed, a camp resident, Bilal, and one more armed guy assigned to our group for security while we're here. This refugee camp looks like a full-scale functioning town. They've got shops of all kinds, and one can find here absolutely anything from sneakers to water pipes. And of course, they've got fresh produce, veggies, fish, and lots of local sweets. So if you need to buy anything, all you have to do is go out and take your pick. All these shops and kiosks are mostly run by the camp's residents. They either own them or work in them for hire. This place looks like a laundry business. I can see some big plastic drums, and this guy here is filling them with some green liquid from a bottle. See, they've got bags with washing powder on the shelves. In fact, this is a shop, and these guys sell all kinds of detergents they make themselves right here. Look at this. It's a local thing around here. People who live on top floors in these blocks of flats have developed a system to avoid walking up and down the stairs every time they need something. They can simply ask for something by shouting from the balcony or out of the window. The vendors put their orders in a basket like this and they pull it up. Saves a lot of time. Another interesting fact, all these people around don't look much like refugees. Look at this guy. He obviously took care to select matching clothes and accessories for his look. This guy here is obviously just chilling out, enjoying his shisha. There are lots of kids outside with many boys on bicycles. People are very friendly and sometimes even beyond all expectations. You see, when I hear refugee camp, I usually think of a bunch of tents in some wasteland where people are struggling. But this camp has been around for decades. If I'm not mistaken, for seven decades now. The time when people lived in tents are long gone. A few generations of camp residents have been born since then. That's right, people get born here, grow up, and continue to live here. Which is the reason this camp no longer looks like a bunch of tents, but a normal, full-scale town. How are you? Hello. I'm fine, thanks. Uh, do you speak Russian? Yes. Where did you learn Russian? In Dubai. Thank you so much. Come. Where to? I'll take you home. We're working. Thanks so much. Nice to meet you.
Но вообще, если честно, пока мне достаточно тяжело. To be honest, it's been quite a challenge to shoot around here because, you know, I talk on camera telling things about what I see and people around stop me, try to talk to me and take me somewhere to talk every step of the way. I mean, it's certainly most amazing that people are so open and friendly here. But it takes a bit of getting used to. We turned the corner and found what looked like a playground for children. Look, the kids have laid out some dishes, cups and spoons, pretty much like all kids do in a sandbox. But if you look carefully, you'll see that these are gravestones. They've got a cemetery on a spot between the residential buildings, and the local kids play here all the time. We are being accompanied by an armed guy in green military fatigues, as they said, for our security. But suddenly, a fight breaks out in the street, and he moves to stand right in front of the camera. No, no, no. Uh, what's happened? Uh, just fight between two persons. They don't want things like this on camera. The guys practically forced me into a side street not to have me get any closer to the fight, and then walked me into some shop to wait it all out there. This looks like an ordinary shop, but not if you look closer. Because, as you can see, they have all sorts of antique guns on the walls. They must be over a hundred years old. These muskets and this rifle over here, it does look like they were used by people more than a century ago. There are also some daggers, an axe, and some swords. I bought these a long time ago from the people I hosted for some time, and I decided to put them here to give the place a historical touch. This is Ali. He owns all these antique guns and works in this shop. He used to reside in a different refugee camp until 2007 when he moved here. Do you know why? Because Lebanon's army targeted that camp with cannon fire. Back when that camp was established by the UN, the UN had a deal with the Lebanese government. You don't touch them and they live as they see fit under our supervision. But then, terrorist cells started to emerge and grow in inside the camp, and they began attacking Lebanese territories on a regular basis. In 2007, a group of Palestinian militants robbed a bank in Tripoli, and then took cover inside that camp. When the police arrived, the robbers opened fire, and all hell broke loose. The camp's security force gave support to the robbers, and the attempted arrest turned into a real war that lasted for months. Over 600 people were killed, and many civilians simply fled to other camps because they were not allowed to stay in Tripoli. Life here is very hard because the economy is getting worse, and many people are struggling. But the situation in other camps is worse than in this one. The unemployment rate there is higher, and there are many travel restrictions that apply. I am renting this shop out. In total, there are 12 Palestinian refugee camps like this in Lebanon. The official statistics say that they are providing shelter to a total of 500,000 people. People here emphasize the fact that this camp is not their permanent place of residence, but a temporary one. And I'm told that all the Palestinians who live here are waiting for that day when Palestine becomes free again and they can return home. When it happens, they will abandon this camp, move out and go back to Palestine. This is one of their most important slogans, and it's written here on this wall. The land that the Palestinian refugee camps have been built on is in the camp's use under a lease agreement that extends for 99 years. The lease was signed by the government of Lebanon and the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Near East, or UNRWA. The image on this wall is that of a holy shrine that is revered by both Palestinians and all Muslims in general. It is a mosque that is located in East Jerusalem. People paint it on the walls here and there in this camp because it is a very important holy site for the camp residents. One of the locals has pointed out another local graffiti to me, 
that of a soldier with no shoes and an AK rifle. And the meaning of this symbol is, yes, we are tired, but we will keep on fighting. As I mentioned earlier, there are lots of different flags in this camp, and the one that is everywhere, naturally, is the Palestinian flag. The other flag you can see here next to it is the flag of Hamas. People, I'm sure you've heard there is a war underway between the army of Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. You might wonder, however, what's Hamas got to do with Lebanon? Let's take a look at the map of Israel and Palestine. This is the Gaza Strip, where power was seized by Hamas in 2007. The other portion of Palestine, known as the West Bank, that is separated from the Gaza Strip by the Israeli territory is, however, still governed by Qatar. Both Hamas and Fatah are large political movements that want freedom for Palestine. But despite the fact that they share one goal, they don't agree on pretty much everything else. Fatah believes in negotiations with Israel, whereas Hamas has a lot more radical views on the methods to use. We all know about the deadly escalation their views have led to by the end of 2023. However, in Lebanon, Fatah and Hamas have found a way to coexist peacefully. They have made a deal and now patrol the streets of refugee camps together. And so the local street are full of both Qatar and Hamas flags and slogans alike. For example, this is just a barbershop and look at all the flags on their walls. Of course, I have no trouble identifying the Palestinian flag. Here it is at the very top. This red flag is that of the local authority that is in charge here. I guess I could call it the uh, local administration. Now, what are these? The black flag here is of the Islamic Jihad movement. And the green flag is the flag of Hamas. Guys, if you like my video and if you like what we're doing, I would really appreciate if you support us on Patreon, on Pioneer or on PayPal. And we try to make even more great films from a new dangerous places for you. Thank you. All the links are in the description. Please donate. Places where men go to discuss news and politics are coffee shops like this one. They have plastic sheet for walls, and inside they usually have a few chairs and a couple of coffee warmers. Coffee warmers like these are very typical for many countries in the Middle East. Each one has a hollow tube inside that is filled with burning coals, and these coals keep the coffee warm. People usually make coffee at home and bring it here in bottles like this one. It cools down on the way, and then they warm it up in these warmers. It actually gets quite hot, and people like it with a lot of sugar here. While we were drinking coffee, the security guard assigned to us told us a lot of interesting things, including how Fatah and Hamas managed to actually collaborate here. Until the Joint Security Force was established, the situation in the camp was very tense. There were many parties and movements here, not only Hamas and Fatah, there were Democrats and others, and all their followers were roughly divided into two opposing camps, and there were lots of conflicts between them. But roughly four or five years ago, both sides decided to join forces and maintain peace and order in the camp together. The situation has considerably improved since then. Believe it or not, both the Lebanese police and the Lebanese army have no legal access to the camp's territory. This is due to the agreement the Joint Security Force made with the government of Lebanon. In case any crime is committed inside the camp, the Joint Force would catch the perpetrators and hand them over to the police. Ahmed serves in the Joint Force. His father is from Haifa. Haifa is now a city in Israel, but until 1948, it was Palestinian. That's when Ahmed's father, who was then only 15, came to stay in a refugee camp. I consider Haifa my home, my home in Palestine, and I want to go there. Of course, I'd like to see Jerusalem and Gaza too, but the one thing I want most is to leave this camp and go and live in Haifa. Palestinians, together with refugees from other countries, have next to no legal rights in Lebanon. Their employment opportunities are very limited. In fact, they can only work on the camp's territory. And since the camp has no production or manufacturing businesses, there are very few jobs available. A Palestinian woman becomes entitled to Lebanese citizenship if she marries a citizen of Lebanon. However, this doesn't work the other way round. A Palestinian man who marries a Lebanese citizen will never become a citizen here, and neither 
Canada will their children. The refugees are not allowed to build houses. All the housing in the camps is provided by the UN. In order to interview a widowed woman called Morina, we had to go through several stages of negotiation. When we first arrived at the camp, we went to see the local authorities to get their permission to shoot around, since normally reporters are not allowed on site here, and no one is allowed to film anything or anyone. We received both their permission and their promise to help us visit a local family for an interview. But then something went wrong and all our appointments got cancelled, so in the end we approached the local security force through our fixer with the same request, because their authority in the camp is higher than that of the local administration. Dealing with the security force wasn't easy either. We weren't allowed to shoot them, not only because they carry arms, but mainly because this is, in essence, at odds with the local law. The law in Lebanon doesn't allow them to buy arms or carry arms, and yet they do. And thus they function here illegally as they maintain order in the camp. More than that, our fixer told me that some of these guys are in fact wanted by the Lebanese police, which is yet another reason why we weren't allowed to shoot anything involving them. But at the end of the day, they came through and arranged for us an interview with this woman, who was very kind to let us see her home and told us about her life here. Morina's family consists of seven people who live in three rooms, so it's pretty crowded. The rooms are very modest, to say the least. This is, for example, one of them. You can see bare walls, very little furniture, a bed and a TV. The paint is very old and cracking, and they have no lampshade. During the tour of the apartment, Marina tells us that the toilet is leaking, but she has no money to have it fixed. <laughs> Morina has four children. Her youngest two, a boy and a girl, are now at school. The education is provided by the UN program free of charge. Her eldest son keeps trying to make some money. When we asked how they manage without a source of income, Marina said that in addition to a small payment her family receives from the UNRWA, she gets help from relatives, friends, and even neighbors. This is what people do around here, and yet it's not enough to get by, ever, since they'd lost the breadwinner of the family, Marina's husband. Hospitals for refugees are located on the camp's territory. There are also hospitals in Tripoli, but they are very expensive. This is a local outpatient clinic for the refugees of this camp. To be honest, I'm impressed. It's pretty nice. I mean, back at home in Russia, where I live, not all outpatient clinics are nearly as nice. Here they have a waiting area with some chairs for people. Over there is the reception desk. What catches the eye in this clinic is how clean it is. Everything's in order and no crowds of people. The one thing we never expected to see here is a doctor who'd speak Russian to us. How are you? Very well. Thank you so much. Uh, do you speak Russian or just a little? I speak Russian fluently. Alan Nasser is a Palestinian. He's a trauma surgeon. He learned Russian when he was studying in Russia back in 2005. Where in Russia did he study? In the south, in Dagestan, in Makhachkala. Wow! And how did you find Dagestan? But Dagestan is like a home to me. It's really like a second home to me. 
Uh, my wife is from Dagestan. I have three sons and one of them is studying in Russia, in Volgograd. Alan Asser works here as a trauma surgeon and his patients pay him whatever they can. If you can imagine that, the doctors here don't get any salary. No, there is no funding from the UN here. We just have doctors here, and they get paid for the work they do, for the consults and procedures, and that's it. There's no other support or funding. The only money we get is from the patients who come here for medical help. Seeing a doctor like Alan Asser here costs five US dollars. That's about five dollars. For comparison, seeing a doctor of the same level of expertise in Tripoli will cost from 20 to 30 dollars. The main problem here is that this clinic doesn't have all kinds of doctors. So to get some specialized help, people need to go to Tripoli, while not many can afford it. I heard that there are big problems with electricity in Lebanon. In this clinic, they have panels that generate electricity, solar panels and the electricity is stored in batteries. There is also a backup electricity generator for emergencies. The generator here is hardly ever used. It's strictly for emergencies. The solar panels generate enough electricity to power the entire clinic. Only in winter, they close one hour earlier when the sun goes down. All the rooms are well equipped and they've got a bed on wheels, plenty of clean sheets, an x-ray film viewer, a medicine cabinet and even an AC unit on the wall. Nothing in the camp is funded or belongs to the government of Lebanon. This clinic is run by the Al-Shifa Foundation. It's a Palestinian organization that covers all of Lebanon. There are 10 clinics like this in the camp, and they are all funded by Palestinian organizations under the umbrella of the UNRWA. The chief doctor of this clinic says they can treat pretty much anything here, but they've got their problems too. The funding is not enough to cover the needs of all the camp's residents. Some meds are unavailable. Medical companies supply meds only to pharmacies, and this also is a problem. This is a donation box, because the clinic is in need of funds, as both the chief and the other doctors told us. So people are encouraged to make a donation here. They've got slots for bills and for coins, which is pretty standard for donation boxes. You can donate to help disabled people, to help buy more medications, and to help emergency patients. Those who live in a refugee camp have to comply with lots of rules and restrictions, and most accept them because they believe they have no choice. But there are those who want a different life. This is Ahmed. He is a teacher of English. He was born in the Gaza Strip and decided to leave in 2007. In the Gaza Strip, all the time you, you feel worry. You cannot live uh, there without any problem. All the time problem, without, uh, there is no, no money. No job. That's it. My family in the middle of Gaza, in Atufah. I love, uh, I love them so much. My mother, my brother, my sister, there, my uncle, aunt, everyone. Only here, my wife and my, uh, my son. In the end, Ahmed managed to find a job as a teacher of English, and not in the camp, but in Tripoli. On a local scene, it's considered a tremendous achievement. Lebanese people look, uh, they look to, to the people inside the camp uh, by different way. And they forbid the people and Palestinian Bar people here in the camp from many jobs. They think uh, I'm not looks like the people in the camp, I'm, Palesti I'm foreign, Palestinian I'm, uh, of outside. Being a foreigner in Lebanon has both pros and cons. People will treat you better than refugees from the camp, yet they will never accept you as their own. I feel some different uh, about my place. Uh, the language, the accent of people, they think uh, that uh, I'm foreign here. Uh, I feel uh, that I'm a stranger. Although uh, I'm, I'm an Arabian man, this is an Arabian country. In spite of I'm Arabian and they are Arabian, I feel I'm a stranger. 
Refugees account for half the population of Lebanon. Aside from Palestinians, there are a few million Iraqis and Syrians in the country. The situation in the country is very bad. The economy has been in crisis since 2019, and all the migrants only increase the economic burden, which is why the people in Lebanon are pretty tired of the refugees, to put it mildly. We were not ready for this number of uh, uh, people uh, to uh, thrive in Lebanon. I mean, speaking of the infrastructure at the, at, at, the, at the beginning, we have between 6 million to 9 million Syrians in Lebanon. 6 to 9 million. The registered amount is only 2 million. So uh, why they're saying it's 6 to 9 million? Because they, uh, they lost count. I mean, they lost count of the huge number of also uh, births of children. Uh, Syrian children are filling the streets, uh, trying to, like, I mean, sell things or beg for money. There are beggars everywhere. They are all Syrians, and uh, so uh, it is. Uh, it is a situation that cannot last, and uh, we are trying by several ways to have them, to have those who are not real refugees to return to their country. My dream to be in a safe place me and my family, and to go home. Freedom. I want to go back to Palestine is what probably every person we have talked to in this refugee camp said to us. People keep saying it, even though it feels like they don't really believe it's possible. Two generations of Palestinians have grown up in this camp since 1948. They don't know a better life than this. This temporary camp is their permanent home, although it's not supposed to be. It's really hard to wrap one's mind around it. What's your dream? <laughs> I want to be a dentist. I want to be a construction engineer. I want to be a doctor. One more kid we met here is Jud. He is the son of Marina, who had kindly invited us to her home. His dream is to play football professionally, but he has no proper shoes to train. The family can't afford a pair of sneakers. Could you ask him if he likes these shoes, or if he'd like some others? We came to a sports shoe store with Marina and her son Jud. He has already picked the shoes that he likes. He really didn't want to come because he's a bit shy and didn't want to go on camera. But I promised him a pair of sneakers as a gift, and he already has them on. And they only cost $15. Hey, thank you. Okay. Thank you.